Growing up, we didn't have much, but I had dedicated parents that taught me and my sisters the importance of giving back and taking care of one another. I was sick as a kid. I had severe asthma that forced me to miss a lot of school. My mom, being the compassionate person that she is, was in and out of work because of the care that I required. My dad faced racism and inequities that prevented him from obtaining upward mobility in a sustainable way. My story has become far too common in the first district of Illinois. Many of us live in poverty. Our babies are more likely to get asthma. We're more likely to have lead in our water and more likely to be shot. We know what causes gun violence in our district. It's not a lack of morals, bad parenting, or video games. It's systemic poverty. It's educational inequity. It's the lack of universal health care. It's environmental injustice. It is a system that isn't broken because it works for those that it was designed to serve. My name is Robert Emmons Jr. and I'm a gun violence prevention advocate, social innovator, and nonprofit leader. I was raised in a small town named Mays Landing, New Jersey, and I grew up in Auburn Gresham on the south side of Chicago. I'm running for Congress to get the federal government to understand that these are common sense gun violence prevention laws that will lead to prosperity. The solutions are simple, and that's what makes them innovative. A living wage, universal pre-K, and access to higher education for all of those who want it. Expansion of transportation accessibility, Medicare for all, and a Green New Deal. These policies and cultural shifts will allow those in our community to live with dignity. For generations, folks have been saying, this is why we can't wait, by any means necessary, and enough is enough. In this moment, we cannot afford to wait our turn. Generations to come are depending on the actions we make today. In our community, we march for our lives every single day, but we ought to live in a world that we don't have to. Join our pursuit of peace and be a part of this movement. We are the solution, together. Hello everyone, I am here with Robert Emmons Jr. He is a 2020 congressional candidate running in the first congressional district of Illinois, and he is here to talk about his campaign. Robert, thank you so much for coming on the program. Of course, thank you so much for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on. Um, it, it's always exciting to talk to candidates from around the country. And you are from this new wave of progressives, of Democrats, who you are outspokenly progressive and you're running for Congress. And tell me why you decided to run, because if I decided to run for Congress, I wouldn't know where to even begin. So what made you want to, one, put yourself through all of this and two, be a fighter at the national level? Yeah, yeah. Um... That's a really good question that we get at every single town hall. Um, and I answer it differently sometimes depending on what's going on in, in my life. Uh, because there were so many different things that happened uh, back in 2018 when I first made the decision uh, to run for office. Um, but to not, today I'll talk about uh, just how I grew up um, and once I moved to Chicago. Uh, so I moved to Chicago uh, when I was 13, turning 14 years old. Um, and I distinctly remember uh, in my high school on the south side of Chicago, every now and then having an assembly um, with the teachers would bring us all together, uh, and they would inform us that we had just lost a classmate, um, a friend, a family member, uh, the uh, uh, former classmate. Um, it's a gun violence that, that weekend. Um, and I remember in those moments thinking about how critical it is for us to, to act um, and to not just allow that to become normal um, because we are losing so many futures uh, to senseless gun violence. Uh, so when, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do when I finished up high school, um, I knew I wanted to get more involved in advocacy. So I applied and got admitted to the University of, of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with my two friends uh, in which we roomed together our freshman year. Um, and that's when I began to really get involved in advocacy, um, criminal justice reform, gun violence prevention, um, you name it, I really wanted to get involved in it. Uh, and during that first year of college, uh, I, re I remember uh, talking to my friend, uh, one of my roommates, uh, about his grades um, and how they began to slip. Um, and then he received a letter from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign um, telling him that if he didn't get his act together, he'd be kicked out. Uh, and despite his best efforts to, uh, to bring his grades up, uh, he was unsuccessful and ultimately kicked out. Um, 
with that, he, he tried to, to remain successful and, um, and, and try to be resilient like he's always been, uh, but he's um, unsuccessful in that as well. Uh, and he needed to move back to Chicago. Um, and when he moved back to Chicago, he fell deeper into poverty, um, and he ended up getting, some, getting into some bad, uh, bad things here in Chicago. And in 2015, uh, he was shot and killed. Um, as you can imagine, that, that devastated me and every single uh, person that was in his orbit. And the thing that kept that resonated with me is that, statistically speaking, uh, unfortunately, his death was predictable. It was predictable because he was living in a system, in a society that failed him at every turn. Our economic system that allowed him to fall back into poverty when he moved out to Chicago, it, it failed him. Our education system that didn't give him the adequate amount of support in order to be successful. Um, it failed him. Um, and even our racist criminal justice system, um, it failed him. Uh, instead of rehabilitating our young people, it's, it's more focused on punitive measures, similar to the academic probation uh, that I encountered at, at the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and I think what drove me to, to run for office was, um, even though his death was, statistically speaking, um, predictable because of what's going on in our, in our current society. It, it was also 100% preventable. Uh, it's preventable with a living wage. It's preventable with access to higher education for all of those who want it. It's preventable with Medicare for all, with the expansion of access to mental health care um, and criminal justice reform and a Green New Deal. Um, so I'm running for U.S. Congress to make this the very last generation to be faced with everyday gun violence. Um, and to do so, we need to address it uh, at its root causes. Um, and that's what we've been missing um, in our country. Uh, and the national media uh, seem to not care as much uh, about what goes on in communities like mine um, as it pertains to gun violence. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we are setting a vision uh, for the country uh, so that people in my community can live with dignity and live in safety um, and prosperity and peace. Uh, that's why we're running for, for U.S. Congress is uh, to, to fight for these progressive, uh, progressive issues, um, to, to make our, our lives and lives of generations to come um, brighter uh, than what the trajectory would suggest today. And I'm so glad that you shared that story. And the reason why I like to ask people why they're running for Congress, even if like generally speaking, like nine times out of 10, when you ask a candidate why they're running for Congress, they talk about their qualifications. They talk about, well, you know, I was a mayor and I have X, Y, and Z qualifications. Yeah. But when I talk to grassroots candidates like yourself, you always really, you have this personal story, this personal thing that happened that impacted them. And the reason why I like to ask this question is because running for Congress is, it's just a huge personal sacrifice like it takes so much effort like you're probably not getting any sleep so i like to ask and there's always a reason behind that and for you that personal yeah. story absolutely um that resonates with people and i'm so glad that you you decided to step yeah. up now you talk about root causes i want to read a quote from you this is in your ad um this is probably my favorite quote of this entire um race so far so this is what you say quote it is a system that isn't broken because it works for those it was designed to serve i know what you meant by that but i want you to elaborate because that is such an amazing way to frame it and it makes so much sense so what policy prescriptions do you have to fix it yeah yeah that's i'm glad you pointed that out um it was a derivative of just what i've i've seen other activists around the country um saying so a lot of times, you, especially in rallies, we, we talk a lot about the system being broken and dismantling the system. Uh, but it occurred to me in this campaign, actually, that the system isn't necessarily um, broken. Um, it's, unfortunately, um, it's, it's corrupted and it's greedy uh, and it feeds off of the vulnerable in our communities, um, like our criminal justice system uh, and how it's fueled. Uh, by the um, amount of folks who are in incarcerated and how we've privatized our prisons uh, since 1984 um, and perpetuated policies like the 1994 crime bill uh, with exasperated vicious cycles of poverty uh, and, and, and in that case, violence in our communities. Um, and it's working pretty well. Um, the, the prison industrial complex is, is a billion dollar industry uh, for, for private institutions. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's working pretty well, um, but we do need to dismantle it because it's not working 
uh, well, for those that was designed to hurt um, intentionally. Uh, so that's just one example of uh, what we're fighting, what we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about broken systems. So one thing we can do uh, with using the criminal justice system um, as an example um, is to ban private prisons. Um, no one should profit off of, of folks being incarcerated. Um, it, it, again, it adds uh, to this, this ugliness um, that has existed in America um, for a few decades, um, in which case, I, I know you've seen the stats, the United States has 5% uh, of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. Um, and one out of, that means that one out of um, um, every 110 citizens have been incarcerated um, within, within their lifetime. Um, and that's an ex ex extremely vicious um, capitalistic way of, of repairing our society when someone um, does misbehave in, in some way. So we need to ban private prisons all, all together um, and, and invest in making sure that our system, our criminal justice system is uh, curated around repair and restoration and rehabilitation um, and not just punitive measures um, that just don't work. Um, and that's why our recidivism rate here in this country is, is so high. Uh, and, and that's what we mean when we say that the, the system is, is, is working pretty well um, because we, the folks who profit off of that are benefiting from recidivism uh, and, and keeping, those, keeping those jails as full, uh, the prisons as full as possible. Yeah, and that's so important. It's it's a really good way, I think, to differentiate yourself from other candidates because people will just look at this mass incarceration crisis in our country and think, wow, this must be a flaw of our system. How can this happen? But if you think about it and you know about capitalism, it's functioning exactly as you would expect because the goal of capitalism is to take every single component of our society and commodify it, turn it into some type of money-making venture. And so when you start turning prisons into this money-making venture and healthcare into a money-making venture, I mean, we really can't be surprised because this is exactly the way the system is designed. So it, 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 it takes people like you to come out and say, the system isn't broken. We just have a system that doesn't work for normal people. And I think that's so important. And for people now to come out and, you know, criticize capitalism, I do really see the Overton window starting to kind of nudge to the left. And it's all because of grassroots activists such as yourself, people who are really saying maybe it's okay to criticize capitalism. You can consider yourself a capitalist, but if you are going to allow things, these things to happen, then maybe, you know, Maybe capitalism isn't what you thought it was. You know, we think about the glorious things about capitalism. Yeah. I love my, you know, my PlayStation 4. You know, I, we love the clothes and whatnot. But we don't think about the way that this affects people at, you know, a very, very concrete level in terms of us getting our basic necessities. So it's, it's incredibly important. And that's why I wanted to bring up that quote, because it really stuck out to me. And I absolutely love it. But let me ask you this. So... Hypothetically speaking, you're elected to Congress. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to do to change the system, but there's only so much time. So let's just say we get the best case scenario. We get, you know, a Bernie Sanders president and a Democratic House and Congress <laughs> or and, and Senate. Yeah. Um, so in that first year, what do you think realistically you'd be able to accomplish if you get elected? Because this is something that for me, there's so many different policies that I want to pass. I don't think I would be able to figure out like where to begin. I would, my head would be spinning. So what would you do in the first year that you think would be feasible? In a, in a ideal world, um, in which you just painted out the scenario, um, the, the, I, I believe that the best thing that I can do for the people of the Illinois first congressional district is push uh, as hard as I can and advocate uh, with members of the house and the Senate um, to reverse the Dickey amendment so that the CDC can study gun violence um, as a public health epidemic. Um, gun violence is a disease and it is contagious. Uh, and it is killing thousands, dozens of thousands of Americans every, every year. Um, and until we can begin to truly study it uh, and uh, get down to the root causes of, of everyday gun violence, we're not going to be able to, to address it the way we're supposed to. I am a social innovator um, by profession. Um, I go around the world uh, with an innovation lab known as Unleash, bringing together a thousand 
young people from around the world to solve some of our most pressing issues uh, focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and one of the things we, we start off with um, is the, the research um, and allowing that to, uh, to, to influence how we design programming and how we make decisions um, because we, we got it to end the epidemic of, of everyday gun violence um, now, not later. 100,000 Americans are either wounded or killed uh, by a person with a gun, uh, whether that be themselves or, or someone um, in their communities um, every year. At that rate, there are going to be a million Americans that will have been directly impacted by gun violence within 10 years. Um, that is a crisis um, that isn't talked about enough um, and is only talked about uh, when there is a, a, na a national mass shooting, which, uh, which the media uh, centers in on. Uh, but this is going on in our communities every single day. Um, and, and we have to solve it, um, and we have to solve it once and for all, but to start, like I said, reversing uh, the, the, the Dickey Amendment uh, so we can actually study gun violence and allow uh, that research to influence our decision um, and, and how we, we advocate and continue to fight for a peaceful, peaceful world in, in all of our communities. That's awesome. Uh, what else would, would you think would be feasible? Because that actually is something that I think there would actually be a large enough consensus to where that would get done because like it really is it's absurd that the cdc can't study gun violence that doesn't even make any sense and of course you know that is written exclusively just for the gun lobby it's it's embarrassing that that yeah. is even a thing um and i actually do think that the, even the democratic party would be on board with that that's kind of a basic step um what else do you think could be accomplished in that first year because you're going to have a lot of people like what i notice is that each um candidate running for congress they all kind of have have their own bread and butter like some are focused on health care some are focused on housing rights and you're coming to congress with you know a, a gun reform agenda so what else do you think could be accomplished in that first year because i feel like if we truly do get um, all three branches, well, maybe not Supreme Court, of course, that's not something, but I mean, electorally speaking, if we can elect, you know, a Democratic House, Senate, and White House, then that first year, I think we can accomplish a lot. So what else do you think could be done, realistically speaking? Absolutely. I think we can the Green New Deal, um, which is also gun violence prevention, um, and that's what we've been saying in, in, uh, around our district and around the country. The Green New Deal um, has the federal jobs guarantee portion of it. Um, and it also would help reverse the impacts of environmental racism that our communities are, are facing in this invested in communities around the country. We can pass Medicare for all. Um, again, gun violence prevention, uh, gun violence prevention policies uh, with the expansion of mental health care uh, for members of my community that are suffering immense amounts of trauma uh, that perpetuate cycles of, of violence. Um, I think we can pass education reform. The, the, the way we fund Schools in, 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 uh, in Illinois is, is, are heavily based off of housing taxes, uh, which means if you live um, in a poor community, your school is likely to be under-resourced, uh, which, uh, which is an injustice in and of itself, and again, set up intentionally like that. Um, so we can, we can pass all these progressive issues. Um, and the reason why I feel prepared uh, to champion a lot of, a lot of the policies I just um, I just. Uh, I just uh, explained and, and, and listed out is when you think about a lot of these progressive issues that we fight for, um, the issues themselves that disproportionately impact uh, black men um, under the age of 35, um, like our criminal justice system, like education, like gun violence. Uh, yet we don't have a single member of Congress that fits this demographic either in the House or the Senate. Uh, so that means we're missing a key voice in Congress right now um, one that understands the interconnectivity um, of these issues, um, having gone through it, having been from a community um, that is facing it, uh, and having friends and family um, that face these obstacles, and fortunately for a good amount of us, overcome them through resilience. Um, but we're missing that voice right now, uh, and I believe I can bring in the stories of, uh, of my district and, and bring in the stories of, of people around the country um, to begin building more bridges um, in Congress, so that way, my kids, your kids, our grandkids aren't aren't fighting for the same things that we have to fight for, 
uh, right now. Uh, that's the mark of a sustainable society is generation after generation uh, progressing. Uh, and that's the way I look at progressivism. Uh, and that's why I happily call myself a progressive. Um, and given that scenario that you illustrated, um, an ideal world, uh, as long as we're, we're civically engaged right now, uh, we can realize that uh, I, I believe that the, the, the sky isn't even the limit for what we accomplish. Um, and then lastly, here's a big kicker, Mike. Uh, we we got we to gotta figure out a way to get money out of politics. Yeah. Um, because that is, that is what, uh, what is uh, hurting and stunting our growth as a country. Um, even though you have 90 plus percent of the country um, as, uh, believing that we need comprehensive background checks, you still have a Congress um, that, that isn't moving the way it's supposed to. We got, we got Mitch McConnell uh, holding HR 8 and HR uh, 1112 uh, on, on his desk uh, because of influences like, uh, like the NRA um, and other dirty special interests that prevent them from actually moving. Um, so we need to get money out of politics, and I believe we can do that with a progressive uh, uh, executive and legislative branch. And then uh, we got some work to do on the Supreme Court. And let's yeah, we, do. Uh, we can talk about it. And then <laughs> we got some work. We got some work to do. Yeah, uh, that's a whole we, different yeah, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just got off the phone with my communications director. We're writing a blog on on it, so uh, so it's fresh on my mind. We gotta yep. get that uh, get that. Post. Oh, for sure, for sure. There, there's so, we could we could literally talk for 24 hours straight about everything. No, so basically, what you all talked about is it's phenomenal. You laid out like your agenda. You cited the lowest common denominator. But let me ask you this though. So you're running against Bobby Rush. Um, he's been in there since I believe the uh the 90s. I want to say I don't know the exact year. Um. So you're running against someone who doesn't have as high of a profile as other Democrats. So my question is, oh, hang on a second. I just activated Siri. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So my question is, um, what is it about Bobby Rush that makes you feel as if you would be a better voice for individuals in that first district of Illinois? Because for, like, if, for example, we have Shahid Buttar running against Nancy Pelosi, Michaela Wilkes running against Denny Hoyer. So to people who aren't in that district, it's obvious. But for your district, you would kind of have to lay it out a little bit more for people who aren't there and don't have the context. So why do you feel as if you are better suited to represent that district than Bobby Rush? Yeah. That's a, a great question um, and one that's critical um, in terms of developing contrast between me and, and the, the current incumbent in which I respect. Um, and I, I, I honor his years of activism in the 60s and, and the 70s. Um, but since he's been a congressman, um, he was elected the same year in which I was born. Uh, I'm 26 years old. Um, he's been in Congress for 26 years. My birthday is in uh, for I guess about uh, three weeks. Uh, Happy birthday! So I only won't be able to use that. Thank you. I won't be able to use that talking point for about a month since he was elected <laughs> in the general election in November 1990. So we'll, we'll we'll stop using that for a month. It's a good um, one. But, but until then, uh, at 26 and 26 and 26, um, in 1994, um, he voted for the disastrous crime bill. Uh, and a lot of Democrats were were wrong about about that that crime bill um and i i do think that it did originate with good intent but ter it had terrible um impact on on black and brown communities around the country um instituting three uh, three strikes and you're out uh and uh you just go on and on and on about how bad that was um and we would have given bobby rush a pass um because of, of the information that was available then relative to what's available now. Um, but 25 years later, um, in the mayoral election here in Chicago, um, he supported a candidate uh, for, for mayor, and there were plenty to, to choose from, um, that in broad daylight, in an effort uh, to reduce crime, proposed that we spend $50 million in drone surveillance um, in black and brown communities. That is the same... Uh, the, the same methods that uh, the 1994 uh, crime bill um, instituted, which does nothing but militarize and criminalize communities. Uh, so that means Bobby Rush, even though he said that was the, the, the worst thing he's ever voted for, 
Um, he hasn't learned from it. Um, and it's important to learn from your mistakes. So that's, that, that, that's, that's one thing. Another thing that, uh, that, uh, that just makes us drastically different um, is our understanding of how to solve the climate crisis. Uh, Bobby Russ sits on the Committee on Energy and Commerce. Um, so the Green New Deal uh, resolution went through his jurisdiction in which he called a smashing grab um, that he's glad is out of his committee. Um, and that should come at no surprise to the people of the first congressional district or folks around the country uh, because Bobby Rush is also taking money from the fossil fuel industry. Um, and this is all the while uh, we, including myself um, in the first district uh, of Illinois, have some of the highest levels of asthma uh, in, than any other place in, in the country. Uh, yet we have a sitting congressman who had who is in the a committee that could help solve um, the climate crisis um, by passing resolutions um, that would put us on the trajectory towards reversing the impact of climate and guaranteeing jobs. And I've already alluded to the fact that that is gun violence prevention um, right there. Uh, Bobby Rush is, uh, is out of touch uh, with his constituency because the vast majority of the people I speak to in the first district of, of, of Illinois they want the Green New Deal. Uh, they want Medicare for all. They want us to address gun violence at its root causes. Um, Bobby Rush is, is late to the party. Um, and what we've been saying and what other progressives around the country have been saying is out of touch, out of office. Yeah. Um, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, President Barack Obama ran against Bobby Rush um, in 2000. And Barack Obama, uh, then State Senator Barack Obama, uh, said that Bobby Rush was out of touch and it was time for change. It's been 20 years since then, uh, so you can only imagine what the people of the 1st District feel uh, currently. And that is why uh, folks all around the district are so excited about this election um, and our candidacy uh, because our mindset is fixated on the belief that we are the solution together meaning one person alone, one election alone will not solve uh, the issues at hand. But when we come together actively pursuing justice and peace, uh, we can solve all of these problems, uh, but we got to do it together. And that is what I've been doing um, as a gun violence prevention advocate, as a nonprofit leader, and as a social innovator, both locally, nationally, and even internationally to solve some of these big issues. And I always do it with my community, not just for, uh, but with. And that really is the difference, I think, between grassroots candidates and community organizers, people who just know the issues of their community, and someone who's been in Congress for years, decades, and like they just grow out of touch. Like this is kind of a similar story that I'm hearing, but you know, throughout the country, you know, their candidates are running against someone who has been there forever, and maybe at first they had a lot of new, fresh, innovative ideas, but time has passed, and they kind of just grew complacent and comfortable, and just feel like, well, you know, I'm. Here here. I don't have to do much. I have, you know, the power of incumbency behind me. Um, and and just this is what I'm hearing. And it's so important that we get new blood in there, especially when it comes to the issue of climate change, because, it, you know, impacting violence in your community, that's something that you can you can make a huge amount of progress with. But in terms of like representing our entire generation, that's also incredibly important because it's people like you and I who we have to think about when you're se when we are senior citizens, what the world will be like after climate change really takes a toll. And it's scary, you know, so it's nice to see people step up and run for Congress. And I already know that anyone who's watching this, they already are going to be behind you 100%. Um, I think the choice is absolutely clear. So let me just have you make your pitch to my viewers. Um, tell them what we can do to help you, where we can donate, and how we can get involved. Because if you get elected, that's good, not just for the first district of Illinois. This is good for all of us, because you're fighting for everyone across the country. This is a national movement. So what can we do to help Robert Emmons Jr. get into Congress? Thank you so much, Mike. I want to point out we have now received contributions uh, from folks in 41 different states around the country um, about ending everyday gun violence by addressing it as root causes, something that the media uh, oftentimes overlooks. We're making sure that the entire same page um, in terms of fighting for peace and fighting for safety um, and fighting for, for this generation 
to be the last generation faced with such violence. Uh, so we, we need your support. Uh, so visit our website at robertemmons.org. Sign up to volunteer. Uh, donate uh, to our grassroots campaign. Um, the current congressman, Bobby Russ, for decades has been taking money from the fossil fuel industry and other corporate PACs. That is not what we stand for. What we stand for is giving the keys to the House back to the people. The, and the people are the only uh, only uh, the only the folks that we, we will be loyal to uh, when we make it into Congress in 2021. So join the movement, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to, to changing this country together. And we are all going to be rooting for you. Let me just make my pitch that I always do for candidates. Um, it's... It, you know, there's a lot of people running for Congress, and so it's difficult. We're kind of stretching ourselves thin just as a movement. But even if you have just like a spare dollar, every single penny helps because when you're going up against someone who is part of the establishment, that political status quo that is well financed, you know, you need people to get behind you. And it seems like you've really hit a nerve because to get donations from 41 different states, I mean, think of that's so unprecedented, right? I mean, to think that. Just 10 years ago, what you're doing would be even possible. Um, it, it really does give me hope. Like everyone, it's easy to be cynical, but to see everyone across the country rising up, just normal everyday Americans who care, who care about the issues that affect their community, it really is. It's just, it gives me hope. So thank you for running. And please, to all of the people watching, consider supporting Robert. Um, anything you can do to help. If you can't donate money, then donating time is also incredibly crucial. And just spreading the word goes a long way. So it's uh, robertemmons.org. And on Twitter, you can follow him at rmmons2020. Robert, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it.